uh, right into the webinar again. Kind of start that all over. So first question from a mom who says, my baby is eight months old. I went back to work five months ago. My supply has dramatically declined. When I started back in September, I would bring home 16 ounces. Now I'm lucky if I can get eight. What can I do to get my supply back up? Um, or is this normal since I started my son on solid foods a month ago? Okay. So when you return back to work, it's not work itself that can decrease your supply, but it, it is easy to have a couple things happen. Number one, uh, because you're not spending as much time uh, with your baby in direct physical contact, it does, it does impact your oxytocin and your prolactin levels. Um, and another thing that happens often at work is even though your intentions are, are great to try as best as you can to express milk three times, if you're going to be away from your baby for a total of 10 hours, which is an eight and a half hour work day, and then some commuting time on either end, that usually equals about 10 hours total, most women will need to express milk three times during that work day. Uh, and for a lot of women, it's pretty, I don't want to say easy, but they kind of figure out how to fit in two pumping sessions. It's that elusive third pumping session that's just a real pain in the neck and it's hard to fit in. So um, one suggestion I have is to pump first thing on arrival when you get to work so that already, you know, it's 9.30, you've already got one of your pumping sessions out, out, out of the way. Uh, and then you can pump again around lunchtime and one more time later in the afternoon, and then you've expressed three times during the workday. Uh, if that idea doesn't, doesn't work for you, then you can actually try it on the other end. So you could try to pump mid-morning, you know, like 10 or 11 a.m. Then you could try to pump again late lunch or late afternoon, uh, and then one more time before you leave. So you might be able to leave work at 5 or 6 with full breasts, but take an extra 10 or 15 minutes before you leave to express that third time, and you'll leave perhaps with the, with the 12 or 15 ounces instead of the 8 or 10 ounces by adding on that third pumping session. And then another suggestion I have for moms whose babies are starting to be a little bit older, often those babies begin to go to sleep earlier than parents do. And so if your baby is nursing at 7 or 8 or 9 p.m., and then you're staying up for an additional couple of hours before you go to bed, then you may want to add a pumping session before you go to sleep. And again, that might be another way to stash an additional several ounces in the fridge, and that can maybe make up the gap between what you're pumping at work and what your baby needs at childcare the next day. Uh, as a reminder, stick with the slowest flow bottle nipple that your baby and your caregiver will tolerate. And unlike formula-fed babies, breast milk-fed babies generally do not increase their milk intake significantly uh, as they get a little bit older. So. Uh, your baby may still be quite satisfied with four or five ounce bottles. Just because they're older um, doesn't necessarily mean that they need to start taking six and seven and eight ounces in a bottle. So uh, they may be able to eat five ounces, and that may keep them happy and comfortable for two to three and a half hours, and you don't have to necessarily continue making bottles bigger. Uh, if he is interested in the solid foods, being eight months old, you could try adding a second meal to the day. And if he's interested and eager, you could begin adding a third meal to the day. And so in the child care setting, the care provider knowing that they can give the baby bananas and oatmeal in the morning and avocado and sweet potatoes and brown rice cereal in the afternoon really does begin to kind of bridge the gap between um, the baby's hunger and the milk that you're providing. So as long as you're using high quality uh, baby foods, then um, it's okay to allow the baby to, to explore and to begin to eat more solid foods if he or she is interested. That's actually going to be our topic next week in our breastfeeding chat. We're going to talk about introducing solid foods to the breastfed baby uh, and feeding the baby from 6 to 12 months. Okay, I'm going to uh, summarize my answer to uh, the second question that I answered when my microphone was not working, and then we'll move into our presentation. Uh, the question from this mom said, what's the best way of determining what level of vacuum to use for my pump? I always use it on the highest setting, uh, and could that impact my letdown since my baby doesn't suck at the same intensity? So a breast pump tries to remove milk the way a baby best removes milk using vacuum to draw the breast and areolar tissue into the mouth and then compression uh, to, to press the milk out. And um, the, the pump obviously is a machine, and uh, you need to kind of figure out what vacuum strength is most comfortable and effective for you. So it's going to vary from mom to mom. 
Uh, making sure that your flange size is the right size for you is going to be critical. But beyond that, some moms have uh, have very dense or tight breast tissue, and so they may tolerate. They, they may not need as much vacuum strength. Other moms may have very uh, stretchy or elastic breast tissue. They may like more vacuum strength. Uh, it's a really, you know, uh, individual adjustment. So a uh, good rule of thumb is to try to increase the vacuum strength slowly until it's no longer comfortable and then back it down a little bit so it is comfortable. So that would be your ma maximum vacuum strength that's comfortable. Um, but again, flange size is going to be pretty important um, because whether you're using vacuum too high or too low, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's you're, you could still be sore, and it can still be ineffective uh, if the flange size is not the right size. And we can talk more about that a little bit later. So I'm going to spend um, about 15 minutes talking about uh, our plan topic today, oversupply and overactive letdown and lactose overload, as well as uh, the difference between oversupply and engorgement. Um, and uh, kind of define these situations. Engorgement, most women have experienced some temporary fullness or overfullness, especially after your baby arrives, uh, typically sometime around day, between days three and six. Most women will have periods of time where they are uncomfortably full. Um, and that's what I would call engorgement. And engorgement can also happen randomly if uh, you miss some feedings or your baby begins to sleep longer unexpectedly. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Oversupply is uh, more of a longer term situation. So uh, engorgement, your breasts are not completely full of milk. They're full of some milk and some edema and swelling, extra fluids on board. But oversupply means that you're just making a lot more milk than your baby actually takes. Um, and so most women walk around engorged, uh, struggle with, with uh, blocked ducts, or become pump dependent. Ended. So they're either pumping exclusively, maybe their baby's in the, in the NICU, or they're doing a combination of breastfeeding and pumping, um, and they need to pump because they get over full and uncomfortable if they don't. Overactive letdown certainly can go hand in hand with oversupply because you've got contents under pressure and there's just a lot of milk there waiting to come out. Um, but some women may not necessarily have oversupply, but may have a very heavy flow or very uh, um, uh, eager letdown, and especially when a baby is brand new, they may have difficulty coping with that flow. And for milk, high milk imbalance, uh, I prefer to call this a lactose overload. Um, we'll talk more about this because uh, I think there's a lot more conversation about for milk and high milk than there necessarily needs to be in most situations. But we're talking about this in the context of oversupply and too much milk, and so. Certainly, if there is a massive oversupply, it's, it's very likely that, uh, that some four milk, high milk imbalance may be an issue for a baby. So we'll explore what that means, too. OK, so engorgement and oversupply, too much of a good thing. There is a difference between the two. Uh, engorgement is edema and swelling, as well as milk. So particularly in the days after childbirth, um, there's a lot of blood flow to the breasts, and that brings in, that's why the breasts feel heavy and, and warm, because there's extra blood flow going on there. And it also begins to shift fluid to the breasts, and particularly, I find, for women that had uh, epidurals um, and long labors and received multiple bags of IV fluid during labor, you may remember afterwards that your ankles or legs were very swollen with fluid. And then uh, two or three days later, guess where a lot of that fluid ends up? So um, sometimes women that have really severe engorgement, it's not just milk that's in the breast. It's a lot of interstitial fluid as well. Um, and then oversupply, again, is uh, the breast truly being full of milk because you're just producing more milk than the baby needs. And so the breasts are full of milk and more milk and more milk. So some people are surprised during engorgement phase when the breasts feel hard and hot and, and huge. Uh, and then they sit down and pump, and they don't get a lot of milk out. And the reason for that is because, number one, it's hard to get the milk out when you're engorged. But number two, it's not all milk that's making the breasts so full. OK, now engorgement and oversupply treatments, too much of a good thing, whether it is a temporary engorgement situation or uh, a longer time uh, overfilling of milk, the treatments 
for comfort can be similar. You'll use warmth before, and that will help get the milk flowing when you are nursing or pumping, and cold after, and of course, my favorite cold packs are bags of frozen vegetables, peas, corn, carrots, whatever. Uh, just keep using them and refreezing them, and they just you know kind of mash around and get into the most comfortable positions on your chest. Um, very, very comfortable and soothing when you need it the most. And ibuprofen, um, I do prefer over Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, because it has an anti-inflammatory process as well, and um, inflammation uh, is part of engorgement. And um, so in addition to providing uh, comfort, uh, if you do have a low-grade fever, it will help with that too, but it also has a very good anti-inflammatory effect. And ibuprofen is uh, considered safe for nursing mothers, and um, most healthcare providers uh, give the thumbs up for ibuprofen, and it's very commonly prescribed after childbirth as a pain reliever as well. 600 milligrams is three of the over-the-counter tablets or capsules, uh, and when you take them every six hours with food, you begin to sustain the effect of it. So rather than just taking it once in a while when you're uncomfortable, if you're taking it for a reason, um, you know, for a sprained ankle uh, or a sore back, you want to keep taking it regularly every six hours around the clock with food so that you keep that anti-inflammatory comfort measure um, stable. Okay, so even if you do have engorgement, some people here, if you're engorged, don't pump. It's the worst thing you can do because you'll just encourage more milk production. And you know what? That's not always true. Uh, being engorged and overfull is not comfortable and it's not healthy for you or your baby or your milk production. It actually makes uh, breastfeeding much harder. Uh, my, my analogy to engorgement is take a beach ball, glue an M&M to it, and then cover the whole thing with olive oil and then try to latch on to that. That's what the baby is trying to latch on to, and uh, good luck. And uh, if he can latch on, he'll probably use his gums and hang right on the nipple, because that's the only thing he can really grasp. If the beach ball is filled up and slippery, uh, the, it's too firm to actually latch on and draw into the mouth. And, and newborns have really small mouths anyway. So softening the breast is going to help the baby latch better. It will make your nipples less sore, and uh, it will then facilitate the removal of milk. Removing milk um, or removing fluid, if you're engorged, uh, sometimes your hands will work better at that stage than a breast pump. Sometimes a breast pump will just draw more fluid to the areola and the nipple, whereas manual compression um, and using manual techniques, using your hands to soften the areola tissue will soften and allow the baby to latch easier. So what you see in these pictures, is a technique called reverse pressure softening. And again, remember, this is not necessarily about removing milk. This is about displacing the swelling of the areola so that the areola becomes softer and the baby can get a deeper latch and then can begin to nurse and, and uh, flow, get the milk flowing. Now, oversupply is different than engorgement because oversupply, as we said, has to do with having lots and lots of milk. So the baby nurses, mom's still full, mom pumps. Two hours later, she's full again, she pumps, and so on. Um, you see this a lot for moms that are uh, pumping from the very, very early days, perhaps because the baby is in the special care nursery, for example. Um, and so sometimes babies initially uh, may not be taking any oral feedings, or they may just need uh, 200 uh, mLs a day, but mom is pumping a liter or more of breast milk a day, and so it begins to add up. Um, in general, we do like to create a little bit of um, oversupply in a mom who's pumping for a preemie because it's really hard to initiate and maintain milk production in that situation, and so removing a lot of milk early on typically uh, paves the road for success in terms of uh, maintaining milk production. Um, but why are some of the other reasons why moms might have oversupply? Uh, you know, you could just be a biological goddess, and um, you know, some women's breasts make a lot of milk. Uh, they have a lot of milk-making tissue, and um, particularly second, third, fourth pregnancies, each time you have a baby, your breasts actually grow more milk-making tissue and proliferate. Uh, proliferate uh, the milk making tissue and that's why um, often people's milk will come in earlier with with future pregnancies um, and babies so uh, whereas if a first-time mom has a vaginal birth maybe her milk comes in around day three or day four 
for a second or third time mom, it may come in as early as day two. Um, overachieving breasts, again, um, breasts that are just over eager to, um, to make and replace milk. A temporary increase in nursing may trigger an increased supply. So maybe the baby has um, a virus uh, or um, uh, is teething and so is doing a lot of extra nursing for comfort. Um, and so that may trigger increase in milk production over the course of several days. And then when the baby feels better and goes back to their typical patterns, mom is left with this sort of increase in supply, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but um, you know that, that's one, one way that it can happen. Um, and then a decrease in nursing. So uh, maybe the baby begins to sleep uh, much longer at night. And so uh, mom wakes up at you know, 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning with her breast very, very full of milk. Um, because now uh, the baby's demands are, are not timed uh, as, as her breasts have been timed. Um, in terms of managing oversupply, uh, we want to do a real slow taper for people that are pumping a load of milk. So maybe pumping um, for fewer minutes or stopping the pump with fewer ounces expressed. So maybe a mom sits down and knows she can usually get a total of uh, six or seven ounces when she pumps. So maybe she'll pump and just relieve a little bit of the fullness um, until her breasts are a little bit more comfortable, but maybe that's just pumping uh, two or three ounces total. So over the course of, of several days of doing that, more limited pumping, uh, that will begin to slowly downregulate her, uh, her supply. And then the feeding pattern adjustment, we're going to talk more about that because that's a very effective method of managing both um, oversupply and the four mil kind milk issue, which sometimes can be related. Um, and uh, there's a misconception that four milk and high milk issues uh, and even cow's milk protein are the same thing as lactose intolerance. And um, so, of course, I have this funny car cartoon here. It says it appears you are lactose intolerant. So for a mom who's on a dairy-free diet, you know, to, to an onlooker, it may appear that, sh that she or the baby is lactose intolerant. But that's actually not the case. Usually uh, when a mom is dairy-free because the baby needs to be dairy-free, it's much more about the cow's milk protein than it is about the milk sugar. Most babies are not lactose intolerant because breast milk contains lactose, just like cow's milk contains lactose. And it's a very rare metabolic disorder, uh, PK, PKU, uh, or, or uh, galactosemia, actually, uh, that makes babies unable to digest milk because they cannot break down uh, the lactose. But uh, that's rare. What's more common is when a baby's gastrointestinal tract is irritated, um, then at that point, sometimes they are also unable to digest lactose easily. Um, if moms do have a huge oversupply, the baby is then getting more of the four milk and higher lactose uh, in relationship to the fat balance. And lactose works like a laxative, so it rushes the milk and then um, the partially digested and fully digested contents of the stomach and the GI tract through the GI tract and it irritates the colon as it goes. And that's why sometimes there's mucus or even mucus in blood in the stool because, not because of an allergy necessarily, but because of the irritation. It's almost like having um, a laxative induced diarrhea that irritates the, the intestinal lining. Um, and the reason I have a picture of, a, of an unhappy physician and, and Uh, they have this high lactose amount, which makes them very gassy and cranky. Um, sometimes it looks like they have reflux, or sometimes it does look like they have a cow's milk protein sensitivity because there's mucus or blood in their stool. Um, and so it's not uncommon for someone uh, who truly has a four milk, high milk imbalance or a lactose overload to end up on medications for reflux or to be suggested to try uh, stopping breastfeeding and try a hypoallergenic formula to see if the baby feels better. Um, but they're not necessarily reacting to an allergen in the milk. They may just be reacting to the, to the uh, frequency of, uh, of the milk emptying through their system. So in terms of four milk and high milk, um, there's not two kinds of milk in the breast, but a lot of people really think that there are. And we get a lot of questions like, 
how long does the baby need to nurse until they get to the, to the hind milk? Or how many ounces should I pump before it's hind milk? So the, the belief is that uh, the fore milk is higher in sugar and lower in fat. Um, and then and, uh, the, the hind milk, did I say that right? The fore milk is higher in, in sugar and lower in fat, like skim milk. And then the hind milk is very rich and thick and creamy, like cheesecake or butter. Um, and moms get really confused about should they offer the second breast, how long does the baby need to nurse on one side, and, and so on. When in fact there's really just one kind of milk. It's called breast milk. Um, and it's not that there's two kinds of milk, fore milk and hind milk. It's actually a gradient in that when the breast is a little bit fuller, the fat is more diluted in the breast and the fat is sticky, so it sticks to the milk duct. And as the breast gets softer and emptier, the fat ratio in the milk rises, as well as the, as the milk fats dislodging easier from the milk ducts and blending into the milk. So it's not that there are two discrete types of milk, like chocolate and vanilla. It's more like um, a very slow and gradual change as the breast continues to be well fed on. So I don't like to use the term empty. but. Uh, because a lactating breast is, like a, is more like a leaky faucet, it's never completely empty. On the other hand, um, we all know what it feels like when the breast is full versus when the baby has fed long and well. It's, it's much softer, and that's uh, the drops of milk that the baby is getting at that point really are like cheesecake, very high fat milk. Um, and that leads to satiation. So fat in your diet is what makes you feel satisfied and full. And this is the appearance of a milk drunk baby who has had their share. Um, and you know, uh, if you were to have a lunch that was, you know, a big salad and a bowl of soup, it would fill you up temporarily, but then you would be hungry later. Um, and uh, it's it's the slower digested fats that, and protein typically contains fat. Uh, it's the slower digested fats that stay in the stomach longer and lead you to feeling uh, full and satisfied. So for a woman that does have oversupply and that is creating that four milk, hind milk imbalance, and you see the baby that's uh, fussy and irritable and has um, green or mucousy or bloody stool, um, simply shifting the feeding patterns can help. So um, here's the funny slide that Cindy was waiting to see. Um, my foam finger is meant to represent one, so one breast per feeding. Um, that is a feeding style that a lot of moms employ already. Um, they'll nurse on one breast at a feeding, take the baby off and burp the baby, put him back on the same side, use a lot of breast compression, and then the baby seems done and mom is done. Other moms will do a similar style of what I call finishing the first breast first uh, and nursing long and well on one breast and then offering the second side and sometimes the baby will take it and sometimes not. So that's a very typical feeding pattern, um, and that would be a feeding pattern that we would suggest, like finishing the first breast first and then offering the second side, rather than a more uh, old-fashioned recommendation of nursing for X minutes on one breast and then X minutes on the other. Um, for moms that have a huge amount of milk, nursing for a few minutes on one breast and then a few minutes on the other is exactly the type of situation that fills up the baby but creates that lactose overload so the baby is getting a lot of um, the fore milk and not as much of the hind milk. Okay, um, a similar uh, scenario is what I call nursing on three breasts. Don't ask me what this, where this picture came from. I have no freaking idea. Um, but it is amusing. I don't think it's real. Um, women sometimes do have an accessory breast, but they don't look like a full breast like that. They look more like a mole, um, and people are surprised to find they have an accessory breast until uh, two or three days after they have their baby when all of a sudden what they thought was a mole gets really sore and tender and then begins to leak. Uh, but since it's not a fully developed breast and it's not being stimulated and it doesn't have a lot of breast tissue associated with it, uh, it eventually stops and, and uh, looks more like a mole again. So nursing on three breasts is not something that uh, is going to look like this lady looks. But what this means is right, left, right, or left, right, left. So this is a good technique um, that I suggest often for people, for example, who have a fussy baby in the evening. Um, when moms feel like their supply is lower, they may nurse for a few minutes on one breast and then switch the baby over to the other side and nurse for a few minutes on the other side and then put the baby right back on the first side again because 
even though the baby nursed for a few minutes on one breast and a few minutes on the other, if you then put them back on the first side, they're going to continue nursing from that from the breast and will begin to get hind milk. Okay, so um, nursing on three breasts can be an effective technique as well. And then block feeding, and that's a good technique for someone who uh, who feels like they are full on both sides and they they need to get some relief. Um, so nursing on one breast, uh, switching to the other, and then making sure the baby finishes up again on the first breast. Uh, block feeding refers to a specific period of time during which you only offer one breast. So for example, uh, a four hour period of block feeding, you might kind of jot down uh, numbers during the day and say, okay, from 12 to four, I'm gonna nurse on the left breast. And so whether the baby wants to nurse once, twice, three times, times it's left, left, left. And then from 4 to 8 p.m., I will offer the right breast. And again, if the baby wants to cluster feed and he's on and off six times during that time frame, I'm just going to keep him on the right breast. And so each time the baby comes to the breast, even though they may be getting a little bit less milk volume, they're getting higher and higher fat milk. So they're getting the hind milk. Um, and often a baby who was very gassy and irritable and was having that greenish, slimy, mucusy stool you'll begin to see with block feeding, the stool often turns yellow again and the baby seems a lot more comfortable and content again. And for babies that were having symptoms that look like reflux, a lot of times those symptoms begin to improve too because the baby is more comfortable. Now meanwhile with block feeding, one side is not being used as much and is going to start feeling really full. And if possible, you want to try to avoid expressing that breast because the whole point of block feeding is partly to make sure the baby is getting the hind milk and partly uh, to create a little bit of um, down regulation in the breast so that the milk production is more in line with the baby's demand. So by sitting around with the breast kind of full of milk, it begins slowly to tell the brain to begin to make less milk, which is usually the opposite that most moms want their breasts to tell their brain, but in the, in the case of oversupply, uh, that's the situation. So again, by constantly relieving fullness by pumping or expressing milk, you often just you know, perpetuate the fullness. By letting the breast feel remain full with milk, it will begin to slowly downregulate. So you don't want to be rock hard and engorged. That can lead to other problems like blocked milk ducts and mastitis. Uh, but if possible, you want to express just minimally for comfort if necessary, uh, and certainly use things like the ice packs uh, and the ibuprofen in the meantime to help yourself remain physically comfortable while your body is adjusting. Now, these are some other things that um, you can become a little bit more aware of if you truly are suffering with oversupply, but I do say use with caution because, um, because you want to have milk. <laughs> you don't want your milk to completely pack up and, and leave. Um, but none of these things used cautiously uh, will uh, completely uh, uh, destroy milk supply. Um, I would say, you know, from a medical perspective, uh, this is old-fashioned Sudafed. It's over the counter, but behind the counter. So this is a non-prescription medication. It's a it's a simple decongestant. Uh, up until several years ago, you could walk into any pharmacy and purchase it. Now you can walk into any pharmacy and purchase it, but uh, it's behind the counter and you need to show your license and sign for it. And that has to do with, um, I guess, some, some folks uh, use this to make um, meth, I believe it is. Um, so this is actually it's a safe medication for breastfeeding mothers to take, but we generally don't recommend it for breastfeeding women with colds or allergies because it does have a side effect of decreasing milk production temporarily. So if you truly are over full, and this is not for engorgement on day five after babies, but this is for women who are uh, producing twice as much milk as their baby may take, you certainly could try using Sudafed to see if that helps you remain comfortable as you begin to downregulate your supply. Uh, it's a relatively short-acting medication, so uh, you know whether it helps you or not, it's going to slow. You know, it's, it's, the effects are not going to be lasting. Um, but as you begin to downregulate your supply, that effect will be lasting. Um, sage is commonly thought of as a medication that helps decrease milk production. There's a lot of different ways you can use sage. You, could, you can use the dried herb like this in cooking. 
Um, you could uh, make a tea. Uh, I believe you can buy a tincture, like an oil, sage oil. Um, but sage can help regulate uh, or down-regulate milk production. And then um, using chilled cabbage leaves, washed, the hard core removed, and crumpled up, and then placed uh, against your breasts inside your bra until they're soft and wilted, can provide relief. And some people feel helps with engorgement. So those are things you can try. Um, oversupply can lead to overactive letdown. And overactive letdown is when the milk just sprays out. Um, and again, this can be a, a medical issue because it's hard to understand what's going on, why a baby is uh, coughing or choking or spluttering at the breast, or why a baby takes um, a lot of milk really quickly and then throws it all back up again because they got too much too fast. Uh, so you do sometimes see oversupply and overactive letdown confused with reflux symptoms or create reflux symptoms. Um, a lot of babies will spit up through their nose, and this is something that I don't see covered in the baby books. But it's very, it's a, it's a very normal uh, scenario to spit up breast milk through the nose, um, and uh, that has to do with the, everything being interconnected. You know, your your nose drains into your throat, so if contents come up with. Force. They'll come out the mouth and the nose. Um, babies often will be very uh, unhappy and fussy at the breast if moms have overactive letdown. So nursing sessions are stressful. The baby wants to nurse but pulls off the breast. The milk is spraying. Um, and often, um, if it's involved with the uh, four milk, hind milk issue, um, it creates the same type of scenarios uh, in the GI tract as CAS milk protein sensitivity can do, so mucus and blood in the stool. Um, and by irritating the passages of the GI tract, it actually can make the baby more sensitive to allergens in, in the diet as well. Um, so how do you manage oversupply? Uh, first, you can do some massage or manual expression or pumping just before breastfeeding to trigger the, the milk to let down, and then you can spray or release milk into a cloth diaper or into a bottle if you prefer, uh, or if your baby catches on <laughs> right into your baby's mouth. Um, but most importantly, with over, overactive letdown, it's the positioning. So I'm going to show you a few slides of um, adapted positioning to nurse the baby in positions where they are not lying on, on the floor with a garden hose posed over their face, but instead uh, have more control over the flow and don't feel as overwhelmed. So sitting upright, straddled across your thigh works. Um, having the baby be on top of the breast rather than under the breast is a good position. I love this image with the mom sitting in front of the fountain because the, milk, the water is spraying out of the fountain. And then look at the stone statue behind her. She's in the same pose. Um, so in the, these positions, um, you can see that the baby's head is higher than their belly, and um, that will help with reflux symptoms. And their head is also above uh, or level with the breast, and that helps too, so that they are not um, uh, they're not underneath the breast with no escape from the flow of milk. And then what's called laid back or biological uh, nursing or or uh, laid back positioning where the baby is essentially kind of sprawled or relaxed over mom's abdomen and uh, is on top of the breast. And this helps in two ways. Number one, when moms are laid back, rather than leaning forward, the milk is going to flow slower anyway by gravity. And number two, the baby uh, is in more control over the flow. And if there's extra milk that they can't handle or manage, it will drip rather than go down the baby's throat. Now, a lot of these situations um, can lead to block ducts, which we covered in great length a couple weeks ago. So I just put this slide up here to remind you. And um, you can go to the same link that you uh, visited to get to this webinar today. And all of the recordings from the past few weeks are there, including the uh, recording on managing or avoiding block ducts and mastitis. Um, so we covered all of these types of positions um, and all of these treatments to manage a blocked duct. 
and in particular mastitis. Uh, women that have oversupply, unfortunately, are going to be more prone to mastitis, and mastitis is just a bummer, and it can make you feel really, really sick which really stinks when you have a baby to take care of. So remember, if you have a fever and chills and a sore breast, please call your doctor and um, begin, begin treatments for blocked ducts, as well as uh, antibiotics to resolve mastitis so that it, it does not um, make you suffer. Um, so as a quick review, oversupply and engorgement are not quite the same thing, and oversupply can lead to um, a four milk kind milk imbalance where the baby is getting too much milk sugar, which can make the baby's GI tract very irritated and unhappy. And so um, by doing things like block feeding uh, and feeding on one breast uh, at, a, at a session, that can help begin to downregulate the milk production. Um, use other things like old-fashioned Sudafed, cabbage leaves or sage very carefully and cautiously. Um, and um, positioning your baby upright for overactive letdown will help as well. And some reminders before I get to all the questions. Uh, for next week, we're going to talk about feeding your baby uh, from 6 to 12 months, so introducing and advancing solid foods, and whether you're choosing to go the purees on a spoon or baby led weaning, we'll cover uh, those different options and talk about those, plus what types of foods to introduce when and what to avoid. Um, please add next week to your, to your calendar um, and uh, help us spread the word. So we'd really like to have uh, 30 or 40 visitors every week. And um, by getting, you know, letting people know about these webinars, that's helpful. And the fact that they're recorded on the website so people can watch them on demand as well. Um, I'm on Twitter, and Isis Parenting is on Twitter. And Cindy is actually the person that tweets for Isis. So you definitely want to follow us there as well. And uh, I think that's it for this step. So Cindy, if you can switch the slides, that would be so awesome. And then I will answer as many questions as I can get to in the next 10 minutes. OK. Let's see. Uh, hi, Nance. It seems like some days my milk production is not as good as other days. Is this possible? Absolutely. And there are things that will make your milk production vary from uh, one day to the next. It can have to do with your hydration, um, your own hormone levels. A lot of times, um, people don't realize that they're getting their period back for the first time, but they will uh, have a dip in their milk production for a day or two. And then um, they begin to feel fullness and cramping, and then they get their menstrual cycle. So that's one thing uh, to think about. Another reason might be that you're fighting off an infection. Um, so when your body is working really hard on Im immune uh, system, sometimes milk production will temporarily dip. So just drink a lot. You know, drink your water, um, eat your food, and keep nursing. And uh, if you're if you need to be pumping as well, pumping after breastfeeding. Uh, and if you're away from your baby, making sure you're pumping frequently when you're away from your baby is the best way to keep your milk production up. If you're concerned about milk production and you just started uh, taking the mini pill, then um, I would think a little bit about that because uh, the mini pill, which is a progesterone-only pill, is not supposed to have a, a detrimental impact on milk production. But unfortunately, some mothers do find it does. OK. Hi, Nancy. My nine-month-old still wakes several times to nurse during the night. We are starting. We are about to start gentle sleep training. Uh, would you recommend cutting out all night nursings in order to be consistent or to gradually eliminate them one at a time? OK. That's a great question because, um, as some of you may know, we have uh, a sleep support program here at ISIS, and it's very uh, it's very personalized, and it's not you know, sort of one type, one size fits all sleep training. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can approach this question. If a baby is used to eating several times at night, then there's a couple at, at nine months. There's a couple different things going on. One is that his metabolic uh, um, the arrangement of his of his food intake is such that that his body expects to get some small amount of nutrition overnight because that's the way he's been doing it. So maybe he gets you know 25% of his 24-hour uh, calories overnight. So you can't just cut those out abruptly um, because his body is used to getting them. Um, and another thing to think about is sleep associations, and I think that's even more significant. Uh, and I think that's that perhaps is where the answer to this question lies. So I would think about um, making sure that your baby 
develops an, another way of falling asleep that is not some, that is not uh, always re relying on nursing to sleep. A good way to do that as babies get a little bit older is to move nursing earlier in the bedtime routine so that it's not the last thing that happens. Now when you have a two or three month old baby, it's very normal and natural for the baby to fall asleep nursing and I'm not suggesting anything else. But if your baby is five or six or seven months old and you nurse them to sleep and they fall asleep and you put them down in the crib sound asleep and then they sleep for a nice long chunk of time, wake up, eat and go right back to sleep again, I don't think you have any issues. If your baby is up every hour and a half at night and that's bothering you, then that might be a sleep association. So uh, if the baby needs to eat in order to fall back asleep each time they wake up, um, then think a little bit about how your baby falls asleep. And if, if uh, feeding is a sleep association for your baby, it may be time to learn new sleep associations. And then that gradually will lead to fewer feedings at night. Um, different people have different philosophies about um, about you know when a baby is ready to go longer without feeding at night, um, we we actually ask people to talk about it with their pediatrician. Um, but in typically a situation like this, what you would do is uh, keep the early morning feeding. So maybe you would use your gentle um, nurturing back to sleep approaches uh, if your baby wakes up at midnight or at two, but um, you know maybe at three or at four a.m when their sleep drive is, uh, is at its lightest and the baby uh, is most restless, that might be the time that you feed them and help them fall back to sleep. Um, so you, know, you can try some of those things. Um, and if you're struggling with it, I, would highly, I highly do recommend our, the, the sleep support program. OK, uh, oh, here's a question. Uh, I started the pill again, and I think my milk supply dropped. Oh, we were just talking about that. I stopped the pill in hopes that it would go back up, but I'm not convinced that happened. Any suggestions? Yes. So um, again, you know, the research does not support that the mini pill impacts milk production. But all I can say is, you know, as a uh, as a person who works with lots and lots of nursing and pumping moms, I have I have unfortunately heard it too many times. Um, so I believe it, despite what the research shows. Um, and sounds like sounds like it's possible that you had that scenario. So um, there's a lot of things that uh, you can add to your regimen that people are told might help milk production. Um, it's very trendy right now to eat lots of oatmeal and eat special lactation cookies. Um, and certainly those things can't hurt. Um, if you want to try sort of a, a safe herbal approach, uh, the four that I put up here uh, are uh, assumed safe for nursing moms, Go Lacta. Um, mother's milk tea, although I typically suggest trying something like fenugreek instead of mother's milk tea because it just seems more potent um, and effective. Fenugreek capsules are very commonly used and tried by breastfeeding moms. I would say in general my experience seems to be about 50% of moms will say that it helped a little or a lot and 50% will say they're not sure. So um, given the fact that a bottle of fenugreek is under $10 and um, is well tolerated and is generally not a concern uh, for moms and babies. It might be something to think about. Um, and then More Milk Plus is another uh, uh, product that's made by a company called Mother Love. Um, and that's another supplement that some people find helpful. Um, drinking lots and lots and lots of water is, is not necessary. Uh, drinking plenty of water is necessary. But forcing fluids will not make you have more milk. Um, so don't drink more fluid than is palatable to you. You should drink and be well hydrated so that your pee is lighter than apple juice. Um, but aside from that, drinking you know gallons and gallons of water will not miraculously make milk. Um, and beer is another one that people ask about. But um, it's not the beer. It's the hops in the beer. And hops are also in non-alcoholic beer. And the darker the beer, the more the hops. So now we're talking about thick, dark, non-alcoholic beer. Doesn't sound so good. How come margaritas can't help milk supply? I don't know. OK, let's see. I'm sending my baby to daycare starting next week. How can I be sure I'm giving the right amount for bottle feedings? Any general tips for an 11-pound, 12-week-old boy? I don't want to under or overfeed. Oh, good. OK, so getting ready to go to daycare. I have a nice slide for that somewhere. That's not it. Oh, we're going backwards, sorry. This one? This one's a good one. Where'd that go? 
Okay, this is the slide I was referring to at the very beginning, making the most of your expressed milk. Um, but I like this picture because the, the four bottles lined up is what I would recommend for you. Um, you want to stick with the slowest flow bottle nipple that your baby and the caregiver will tolerate. A bottle feeding for a 12-week-old baby really should take 20 to 30 minutes, not 5 or 10 minutes. The longer he sucks, the more content he's going to be on the same volume of milk. So I would assume that he'll take somewhere between um, three to four ounces, probably four ounces will, is, a, is, a, is a, a good portion of milk for him. He may do fine with three or three and a half. Um, if he consistently finishes three and a half or four ounces, if he seems satisfied for two to three hours after that, it doesn't mean that he needs much bigger bottles next time. Um, as I say, you know, just because you finish your, your meal does not mean you should have had more meal. Maybe it means it was the right amount. If you finish your meal and are content, it's probably the right amount. Um, so I would make the bottles somewhere around three to four ounces, depending on what he seems to typically take at home and be comfortable with, plus um, an extra bottle that's a snack pack, so an extra couple of ounces in case you're delayed or he finishes one feeding and still seems um, unsettled. That way they have a little bit more milk they can offer him without opening a whole new bottle. Um, so in general, uh, I typically suggest sending, sending your three-month-old with perhaps 16 ounces of milk. That's one six, 16, but um, hopefully he will not take all 16. You want the caregiver to be feeding him in an upright paced position, not laying flat, and you want a slow flow bottle nipple. So it really does take 20 to 30 minutes for those same three to four ounces uh, to be fed. And then earlier we were talking about um, an older baby and uh, the, the mom that had the baby that was nine months old and was asking about milk supply. Uh, the baby's breast milk intake can remain the same, absolutely stable. Uh, from 6 to 12 months, what begins to change is gradually dabbling in solid foods, high quality, high nutritional uh, density solid foods will begin to make up the difference between um, what the baby's breast milk intake is and um, you know, making them uh, orally content um, and having the caregiver have things to feed the baby. So uh, next week we're going to talk specifically about introducing cereals, fruits, vegetables, protein foods, dairy foods. Uh, purees, baby led weaning, and so on. So hopefully you'll attend for that. Uh, my son seems to have something against my right boob. He hates nursing from it. I've tried starting with it when he's hungry and ending with it, no change. Any suggestions? I can pump from it so it has milk. Yes, I'd love to know how old your baby is. Is your baby brand new? Um, I, I don't have that information, but I'd like to know that um, because it could, it could simply be the shape of your nipple or um, uh, you know, that you have a harder time or an easier time latching him on one side or he's more comfortable on one side than the other. But if he's quite new, um, I would, I'm more concerned and I would, I would focus on uh, using different types of positions to help him take the right breast and we'll talk, uh, I'm going to give you some examples. The reason is if you're, if you're always nursing in the cross cradle hold, and he'll take the left breast but not the right breast, it makes me wonder, Just I just want to rule out that he doesn't have something going on with his shoulder uh, or his neck, like torticollis, which is a tight muscle in the neck. Um, and uh, sometimes when babies have uh, a shoulder or arm injury from birth or a tight neck muscle, um, they have a much harder time assuming certain positions or certain positions make them really uncomfortable which reminded me to mention some of you with older babies may find this after your babies have certain vaccinations. So if they have shots in their thigh and their thigh is, is um, a little bit swollen, a little bit pink and warm and really uncomfortable to them, laying on it, you know, having direct pressure on it may be uncomfortable. So for an older baby uh, who just had vaccinations the day before, it may not be um, the breast that's the problem, but maybe the baby's Position. But that's what I want to rule out with you um, is the baby's position. I want you to imagine that you're like just look at the picture here that the in this picture the mom is nursing on her left breast. But imagine putting an extra pillow next to her on the couch on her right side and then sliding the baby in the exact same position over to the other breast. So the baby is nursing on the right breast, although approaching it just as if he just in the exact same position as he approaches the left breast. Uh, if you can imagine that, 
that's one thing to try. Also, are you able to nurse in the football position or sideline on that other breast? Um, so those are some things I would think about. Um, if you think it has to do with the nipple shape in particular, like maybe that side is uh, flatter, um, then um, I, I might suggest a consult so that we can work with you on that. Um, other, I think you've done a, a nice job uh, trying to figure out, and I wouldn't give up, about um, if, he's, if he's frantic and hungry, start on the side that he has an easier time with. Um, and then after he seems uh, like he's relaxed a little bit, try him on the other breast. Uh, but I would perhaps try different positions and see uh, if you can get him latched in a different position on that side. Okay, I think we'll take one last question and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, I have an 18-week-old. She nurses every hour and a half or so, it or less, it seems. I'm trying to increase milk supply since I returned to work part-time two weeks ago. It's difficult because she nurses first and during the night as well. Have you heard of a kale pineapple smoothie to help increase milk? Does it work? Uh, four milk, pine milk, I just want more milk. OK. Um, as I had joked earlier, um, there's always something that's, you know, that's recommended to make more milk. Um, it can be cultural. Uh, it can be um, you know, ethnic groups have certain um, foods that they recommend or steer people away from. Uh, I was saying earlier that oatmeal um, and lactation cookies and muffins are very popular right now. Kale. Not so much for nursing moms, but just for the you know crunchy natural moms and families. Kale is very very hip right now, um, and so a kale pineapple smoothie. Uh, I I have not heard of that in the context of increasing milk production, but um, it, it it can't hurt. Uh, I don't know that it's going to have any particular impact on milk production um, aside from the nutritional value of the smoothie itself. Um, 18 weeks old and nursing frequently. Um, I think what I would recommend is, uh, you know, is do what you're doing. Um, a lot of breast compression while she's feeding. Try that nursing on three breasts thing that we were talking about earlier, so that when she's getting a little uh, fussy after after nursing on one breast for a few minutes, switch her over to the other side. Use breast compression and massage. Maybe she'll nurse for five or seven minutes on that breast, and then when she starts squirming around and and pummeling you, switch her back to the first side again. Uh, and sometimes when babies uh, come back to each new breast afresh, they work a little bit harder. That can trigger an additional milk letdown. Using the breast compression firms up the breast tissue, nudges it a little bit deeper in the baby's mouth, triggers another burst of suckling. So uh, that might help. And then the other recommendation I would have for you, since she's, she feeds frequently, is to leave your pump set up so that after she breastfeeds, you can put on your hands free Bustier, which I hope you have, and double pump for a few minutes. If she's nursing on both breasts, then maybe double pump for just five to ten minutes after as many breastfeedings throughout the, the, the day as you can. Unhook the tubing and just put the bottles and flanges in two coffee mugs in your fridge, just like in the picture, um, because you're just going to be expressing very, very small volumes of milk. And um, uh, two hours later, she wants to nurse again. You nurse her, and then same thing. You put on your hands-free bustier so you can keep her entertained or play with her or read to her while you're pumping. And then uh, double pump. Just hook the tubing right back up and pump into the same collection set on top of the same milk. Maybe each time you're just adding 20 or you know, 15, 20, 30 cc's of, of milk there. So maybe at a half an ounce of milk you're expressing each time from each breast. But a few very important things are happening. By eking out another drop and another drop and another drop of milk from a breast that's been well nursed on and well emptied, uh, you're actually triggering that important message to the brain that tells the brain that more milk is being asked for. And so overall, production should increase. Um, and then gradually throughout the day, you're collecting small volumes of milk, 20 cc's here, 30 cc's there. And then by the end of the day, if you were able to pump three or four times for five or 10 minutes after most breastfeedings, by the time you pull all that milk together, uh, you probably do have uh, three or four ounces of milk there. And not only that, that's really high fat milk. Um, that's the cream. And so there's another additional volume of milk um, that you can add to your, uh, to your milk pool for your next day at daycare. Um, also, um, you know, at 18 weeks, you're just, 
you just you know just kind of hang in there a few more weeks because your your baby is now at her maximum breast milk intake. She's not going to really need more milk than she's currently taking. The same volume of milk will actually sustain her and help her grow and gain and thrive over the coming months. Um, but gradually over the next uh, two months or so, you'll be able to begin dabbling in solid foods and then advancing solid foods. And then that means she'll have a, a bottle of, uh, she can have uh, breast